All right, so vascular tissue. That's going to be composed of the xylem and the phloem. So the xylem's job is to conduct water throughout the plant, and the phloem is going to be conducting food throughout the plant. Um, so that's really all there is to those. I think I've got some cool pictures of them if you want to see. Um, yeah, so that's going to be um, vessels and tracheids in the xylem and phloem, so that's kind of neat. But now what we're going to get into is, um, whoops, sorry, <laughs> got ahead of myself, root structure. So um, I'm going to show you a picture, and this picture is going to have um, these four different zones that we're going to have in a root. So I went a little ahead of the game here. That's the fun stuff coming up, um, but my computer has decided it wants to be slow, so... There we go. Okay, so here are the four areas on a plant, uh, on a root. So you're going to have the root cap, which is going to be composed of dead cells, and that's going to help protect the root as it pushes through the soil. That's going to be followed by the apical meristem, um, which is going to be where that primary growth is happening, and that's also going to be the zone of cell division. So you're going to see a lot of mitosis happening there. I'll bet you can guess what happens in the zone of elongation, but I'm still going to tell you. So the cells get longer in the zone of elongation. You're welcome. And then the last part there is the zone of differentiation, and that's where the cells actually get told what type of cells they're going to be. All right. So that's the zones of the roots. Now what we're going to get into is modifications that roots can have. So sometimes they're having problems anchoring in the soil. Sometimes they're going to be in a dry environment. So whatever we're talking about there, plants can actually have some sort of adaptations to help them to do that. So the first one we're going to talk about is prop roots, and those literally prop the plant up. So these are prop roots right here on a corn plant. So those are going to grow outwards, and that's going to help to kind of keep that plant from tipping over if it gets too windy. Then we've got aerial roots, which are going to grow up into the air, like an orchid has, and those are going to usually in areas where it's going to be pretty humid, and so um, those can actually extract water from the air. Then you've got pneumatophores, and um, pneumatophores, I know that looks creepy. It's what makes a swamp creepy in my eyes. And so um, those are probably from these trees that you see here. And so this happens when you have soil that doesn't have a lot of oxygen. So they'll grow into the soil, and then they'll grow back out to actually extract oxygen that way. Um, then you've got contractile roots, and these are actually going to spiral into the soil. So they're going to be in areas where you have a lot of erosion, and so that helps to anchor the plant really, really well. So like lilies are going to have that. Then you've got parasitic roots. So all this yellow you see here is actually a parasitic root of dotter, and um, what that does is just like it sounds. It's going to grow into another plant and suck out all their nutrients. Um, just as a fun fact, mistletoe is going to be um, parasitic as well, so um, that's fun to bring up when you're under the mistletoe. Um, and then you're going to have different types of storage roots. So you can have a food storage root like this radish that you see here, and that's going to be as a result of low nutrients in the soil, so it's going to store up nutrients whenever it can. And I don't have a picture of a water storage root, but that's going to be like pumpkins and stuff have those. And so those are designed to grow in an area where it's dry, so when it rains, they actually store the water so they can use that when they need to. All righty. Um, and then the last one is going to be buttress roots, and buttress roots are going to be these guys that you see right here. Um, that's actually a picture of a group I took to Costa Rica. Um, and that is to actually help to keep big trees from tipping over as well. All right, so in the next group, we're going to talk about modifications of stems. So stems can also have modifications to help serve whatever special purpose they have to have. Um, so we've got <clears throat> bulbs. So bulbs are going to um, be where you've got this little stem down here, and then you've got the big fleshy leaves growing off of it. So you've probably heard of bulbs like tulips and stuff like that are going to be bulbs. Then you've got corms, and um, corms are going to be a modified stem, but they don't have those fleshy leaves. So they have the same setup as a bulb, but no fleshy leaves. Then we have rhizomes, which are going to be like what ferns have, and that's an underground stem connecting all the plants, and then they have roots growing off of those. And then we have runners and stolons, which is like a strawberry plant, which just are horizontal above the soil. So it's just like a rhizome, but above the soil instead. Then you've got tubers. Tubers are almost like a storage stem. Um, so certain types of potatoes are going to be in that category. 
And then you've got tendrils, and tendrils are going to be a way that something can use to climb up. So think of ivy, um, sweet peas is in this picture um, that we see here. All right. Then the last part we're going to talk about are the different types of leaves. So leaves, as we know, are going to be important for photosynthesis, and they could be simple or compound. If they're simple, they're all one piece. If they're compound, they're going to be divided into leaflets. And um, got some pictures of that here. So this is a simple leaf. It's all one piece, as opposed to a compound leaf where it's divided into little pieces, right? Now, compound leaves can either be pinnately compound, like you see here, and that's where you have two leaves coming off per node, or it can be palmately compound, where they're all radiating out from one common location. And I remember that. It's like your fingers coming off of your palm, right? Then they can also have different setups on how they come off of the branch. So you can have alternate, where you have one leaf coming off of this side, one leaf off the other, and so on and so on. You can have opposite, where you have two leaves coming off per node. And then you can have world, which is where they're kind of um, a little circle coming off of the branch. Now, don't confuse that with types of compound leaves. You could have compound leaves coming off of the branch in an opposite, and you can have compounds coming off as alternate. So try not to confuse those. And then the last thing we're going to talk about here is going to be um, adaptations that leaves can have. So you can have what are called floral leaves or bracts, like this poinsettia. So these are actually leaves. The flowers are these lame things right here in the middle. So usually floral leaves are a result of having a lame flower and you need to um, get pollinators to come. Then you can have spines, and spines are going to help you to um, keep from losing too much water, so like a cactus. You can have reproductive leaves where the leaves are going to kind of grow in these clusters and then you could break those off and it'll turn into a whole new plant. More commonly, you've probably seen a spider plant and these are those reproductive leaves and you can just crack those off and make a whole new plant. And then one of the ones I think is super cool are window leaves. So if you look at the tops of these leaves, um, they're brown, and then they're all clear, and then the green is down on the bottom. And what happens is these are submerged under the soil all the way up to that like brown point, like as much as we can get. And then what's going to happen is they can actually do photosynthesis underground because of this window part here that's going to allow sunlight to penetrate underground. I think that's super cool. Um, then you've got insectivorous leaves, and those are going to be the ones like a Venus flytrap that are going to actually um, eat different things. And so that's as a result of having low nutrients in the soil. <clears throat> so if you want to see some videos, here's a Venus flytrap doing its thing. Hopefully this will open. Um, maybe that will do it. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so you can actually see it. We'll make it bigger. Um, but I'm sure you understand how a Venus flytrap works. Um, this gets a little bit crazy, as you could tell by the title, but um, just go with it. It's pretty neat. So there you can see um, an insect getting eaten by a Venus flytrap. And then, of course, you can also see a frog getting eaten by a Venus flytrap. Um, so that's going to be that one. And then we also have um, something called a sundew, which is such a cool little plant. It actually has these droplets on it that are like honey consistency. And so um, what it does is it actually traps the plant like you can see here. And then eventually the plant is going to enclose on it and release enzymes to um, digest it. So that's pretty cool. Um, and you can order these and um, grow them in your office. Obviously, that's what's happening there. But they're really, really neat little plants. Um, all right. So I just want to look through here and make sure that we've seen everything that we need to talk about. Yep. All right. Um, so that's going to be all the adaptations that you can have for stems and leaves and um, roots.